Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? My name's Adam Terrell, and I'm here to encourage you to obey the law and think about it and speak about it constantly. I broke the law. Christ paid my debt by sacrificing himself so that I can be clean to offer myself as a living sacrifice back to God. The entire Mosaic law is obligatory for everyone. Keeping some of the laws look different today because the light of further revelation supersedes shadows in the old law. The temple sacrifices are an example where we have something better. Note that we must still obey the Mosaic laws for sacrifices. There is still a temple, and priests are still required to offer sacrifices. It's just that the priests, the sacrifices, and the temple are all better now. God will show grace to those who apply the law to themselves, to those who have hidden the law in their hearts, and he will judge those who disobey accordingly. I must apply it to myself, and then those around me will see its fruit and be drawn to its goodness. Theocracy grows by the sword of the Spirit, God's word, and self-sacrifice. The law's purpose is to give a path to restoration. Christ has restored me, so I must seek to restore others by sacrificing myself. Thanks for listening. My goal with each conversation is to edify and bring the law and wisdom to bear on each person's current situation in life. Let's jump into this week's interview. My guest this week is Caleb Shoemate, author at thelibertarianrepublic.com, which is headed up by Austin Peterson. Caleb grew up in a Christian home, and we discuss his journey from traditional conservatism into libertarianism, as well as the theological basis for that switch as it relates to government authority specifically, among other things. We poke at each other's view of God's law, too, and look for new ideas that we haven't encountered before. I think you'll find it a practical, timely, and fruitful discussion. Let's go. So, Caleb, tell me a little bit about yourself, your background, um, and if you want to weave your political journey into that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, uh, well, to begin with, uh, I'm 26 now. I just turned 26 this past December. Um, I started really getting into politics probably about 2013, and then I was uh, introduced to Glenn Beck around 2014. Oh, yeah, I remember us talking about that. Like, he lives, uh, he's in the studios like an hour south of me, basically. Yeah, and, and Glenn Beck... When I was introduced to Glenn Beck, it was like I had this nirvana moment. I'm like, oh, my God, there's somebody that thinks exactly the same way that I do, and he's articulating all the things that I've already said. <laughs> because it, it was my brother-in-law that introduced me to him, and, and I would come home from college, you know, because I'd always been very much into history. I'm a lifelong student of history. I've been that way ever since I was a child. Um, but... I would come home from history, and thank God I had a, a really good history teacher. And we would talk about the progressive movement, and you know how it's deeply rooted in both parties. And I would come home, and I would complain about Republicans and Democrats equally. And I'm like, no, we're both screwed, and it's because they don't give a crap about the Constitution, right? You know, and, they, and they equally don't give a crap about liberty. I mean, with the exception of people like Rand Paul, Mike Lee, and Austin Peterson, but then the good people of Missouri don't have. The common sense to elect Peterson. <laughs> um, but uh, I would come home, you know, and I would complain about that. And he's like, you know, you sound a lot like Glenn Beck. And I'm like, who's this Glenn Beck? And then I listened to him and I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, where has this guy been all my life? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming to him, you know, the blaze Glenn Beck. So it's much more libertarian than conservative. Right. Um. And then I get introduced to Austin Peterson around is during his presidential run. I, I remember I had voted for Ted Cruz. I was originally a Rand Paul guy, but by the time it got around to to voting in North Carolina, which is where I'm from, <clears throat> he, um, you know, it was pretty much Ted Cruz was the only contender to Trump. And so I voted for Cruz because I didn't feel like I was sacrificing any of my core principles. Mm -hmm. 
And then after Ted Cruz dropped out, I'm like, oh, my God. Because well, I, I expected Trump to be, you know, typical progressive Republican. Um, and then I don't believe anything happens by chance. just so happens that um, I turned into a, a live stream. I just got notified, uh, often did a live stream reaching out to Ted Cruz supporters, and it, it showed up in my news feed. Never, never heard of him before in my life. And I'm like, oh my God, where, where has this guy been? You know? <laughs> I, 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 and you know, it got me because I had considered myself a libertarian, you know, pretty much the whole time I've really been in politics because because of my Christianity, I, I would still consider myself to have politic, socially conservative views, for mm-hmm. lack of a lack of a better word, but it's it's really just biblical views uh, socially. But I don't want to enforce them on anybody else, you know. And, and so when it comes to Austin, it was like I love libertarian candidates, but none of them really seem to be pro-life besides Ron Paul. And, you know, I wasn't old enough to vote for Ron Paul when he ran. And then I'm like, wait a minute. There's this guy, and he's pro-life, and he's speaking. He is really ringing my bells, you know. Right. And uh, so – um you know, I just, I got into it from there, and I, I followed him. I, I become a fanboy really quick, uh, and uh, I supported him through his presidential campaign. And then when he ran for senate, I supported him there, and uh, that that kind of brought me into where I'm at now. I mean, I can get into that. I'll let you ask more questions, but that that's pretty much my whole journey as a whole up to to where I'm at now. Okay. Were you raised, um, uh, you weren't homeschooled, were you? I was homeschooled, so I feel like I have to ask that question. Unfortunately, no. I, I wish I was. My, my brothers were. Um, I'm the oldest of four children. Um, my youngest two brothers, because uh, I have a sister and then two other brothers. My mom actually was in the public school system uh, when we moved. I'm originally from western North Carolina, but I've lived in the eastern part okay. for around... 13, 14 years, but she was in the public school system as a teacher assistant for several years, and she just thought, oh my God, you know, how awful this is. Right. From first-hand experience, and she's like, I can't continue to subject my kids to this. Wow. And, and so she felt the urge to uh, get out and uh, to start homeschooling, homeschooling my brothers, and they're, they're better for it. I'm like, man, I wish you could have done that with me. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, tell me about your uh, experience writing for the Libertarian Republic. If you want to tell me a little bit about the the website as well, you're welcome to do that. Uh, my experience with the Libertarian Republic, I've, I've only been doing it for about three months, but I tell you, it's been awesome. It's really been a blessing. As I say, not, nothing happens by chance. I don't believe in that, and I, I look at it, you know, God has had his hand on it as a person of faith. Um, and it just so happened I was hanging out in Austin streams, you know, and just being a friend. And it's pretty amazing that that I'm able to talk to somebody that I admire just as easily as I'm talking to you. And I consider him a friend now. And that's that's pretty awesome, you know. Yeah, yeah. I see um, it has a lot of activity on your posts. Yeah. Um, but to be able to talk to someone and consider them a friend, and uh, I work with some amazing people. The people are very kind. Um, I would say that we have some of the best people in the business especially for a small a small company we definitely give the big guys a run for their money and we definitely have a a core group of people that really care about what we're doing yeah but it's just a really pleasant environment and everything you know yeah so how um how many articles that you have you put out for them so far do you think well i have put out i was looking at that today i have put out 86 are on the site. I've actually done 87, but I lost one. The site went down for about four days because between me and another guy that we call Squiggly Line Guy, his name's in Japanese and nobody knows how to say it. <laughs> but I, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with any of his um, his writing, but he does a lot of satirical stuff for us. Okay. No, I haven't. But, yeah. Yeah. He, he's hilarious. Um, I definitely recommend that you check him out. It, it's fun to be around. I can't wait to meet him in person. But um, between the two of us, we would just bring so much traffic to the site. That I, I think he was the one that crashed it that time because he had <laughs> a, piece, a, a piece that hit really big and it brought down the servers. 
<laughs> and I, I just remembered that between the two of us, it was like Austin was having the time, you know, just keeping the website up because it was like I'd crash it and then he would crash it. And, but I ended up losing one of my articles in a reboot. And then there was one that I wrote um, that I didn't get to submit because I didn't get, I was trying to secure an interview and I couldn't get the interview I wanted. And so I ended up just scrapping the piece. So that would have made about 80, 88. But I've currently got 86 on the, the website and have written 88. What are some of your articles that have gotten the best response? And uh, My biggest one that got over 20K it was about the $15 minimum wage raise in New York. Do you think and, that uh, was just a timely article? Or, or uh, do you have any sort of idea why it blew up so much? Well, I, I think that, you know, with some of the stuff, it's, it's unpredictable. What I am learning is, you know, that there is an unpredictable element, but I'm learning that, you know, you want to uh, write about things that are relevant in the news. And what I want to write about necessarily is not always what people want to hear. Right. So, so if I have a particular thing that I want to, you know, communicate to people or a specific set of things that I want to talk about, if I can try to weave them into current events, of something to make it relevant to what's going on in the news, and that's great because I did a piece on the morality of capitalism that I thought was very well written, and I mean, because I, I put my whole heart into everything I've ever written, um, and I think that just goes back to who I am as a person, and I try to have the best work ethic possible. But that the piece didn't do well. I mean, it was like in the low hundreds, and I was just like, oh, mm. what have I done? You know, because I had had a couple pieces that really blew up and got like over a thousand, and I, I hadn't even been at this place two months yet. And then I'm like, oh my God, what happened? It dropped off to just a couple hundred. And then uh, Austin kind of talked to me and sat me down and was like, no, no, it's, it's not you, and you're doing fine, but you need to, you know, here's what you need to work on. And it was just some constructive criticism. and and tender lovingness and sometimes you know constructive criticism can go both ways but i knew that it's like what he told me he said i believe in you and i'm pushing you harder because i see your potential and and so hearing that from a friend and knowing that someone that i admire believed in me that much to push me that hard it made the, the criticism much easier to hear tell me about your um christianity were you raised christian the whole way through or was there a uh, yeah conversion I, I, moment I was raised in a Christian home, but, uh, you know, so I've always had exposure to it my whole life. But as far as a conversion moment, I first professed faith when I was seven. Uh, I remember I was, it was an experience. I was at a, um, at a play and, um, I, I don't like, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm glad that I came to faith at a young age, but, Looking back on it, I don't think I came into it the right way because I was kind of scared into it, hmm. and, and that, that, that's one of my one of my criticisms of a lot of people. Even though I think they mean well, is that you know they want to scare people into salvation instead of preaching that that God loves them, and, and, and instead of trying to scare them into it with hell, you know. And uh, as a seven year old little boy, you know, with with you know, I was like, I don't want to do that. You know, but I was terrified. You know, right. and um, so I, the, there were ups and downs and periods of where, um, you know, that I had to come to the full realization of that. But but I had first professed faith when I was seven, and as yeah. I got older, it kind of come into it more. Yeah, I notice um, some people I feel can really encourage their children to call themselves Christian at a. Uh, sort of an unhealthily young age. It's like yes. you would like a three-year-old walking them through, and it's like, do, do they really understand? Because like a three-year-old, they would they would basically believe anything that you tell them at that age. Right. I mean, they, they believe in the tooth fairy, you know. Right. Yeah. If you want to tell them that you wanna you want to go be with yeah. mommy and daddy in heaven and um, pray this prayer to the one-eyed, one-horned flying purple people eater they would do it <laughs> right right and, and you know there, there's some very sharp criticisms that i can have of the church at times and i, I think that that's one of them is is not necessarily the heart behind what some people do but the methods are you know it's, it's all wrong because i i don't think faith is not just you know pray this prayer and that, that 
you know, you're automatically fine. Or it, it shouldn't be a, oh, I'm fine. I, I got my heaven, get in the heaven free card. It, right. it should be a relationship, you know. And, and I, I try. I don't. I don't talk about my faith a lot. You know, I, I don't. I don't beat people over the head with it. I just try to live it out, and I, I do. You know, I only try to do what God tells me to do, and and do like what Jesus did. He only ever did what he saw and what he heard the Father say. And uh, so, if I I try to live that out the best I can, then then I know that I'm I'm doing more with my actions than my words could ever say. Mm-hmm. What were some of the the actions that you saw that got you thinking more out of conservatism into libertarianism? Well, that, that was actually fairly easy because I'll tell you, I, I remember one of the, one of the few votes when I voted at a young age, when I was 18 years old, there's no way on earth that I ever should have voted. Um, but uh, because I, 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 <laughs> I hear I, you, I, I, I was still in the mindset of Republicans good, Democrats bad, you mm-hmm. know, and I didn't know the whole progressive thing. Um, but when I realized that libertarians are about freedom and about limited government, and about the idea of just because I think things should be legal doesn't necessarily think that they should necessarily be the right thing. Yeah, that's do. a big one. You know, like, like for gay, gay, gay marriage, for example. I have the the standard, you know, biblical worldview of, of you know, uh, what traditional marriage should be, you know, between a man and a woman. Right. But we know that God defined marriage. God defined marriage when, when he created Adam and Eve. Right. So it doesn't matter what government says marriage is, because it's not it's not their place to define it anyway. Right. And, and, and so it really bothers me when conservatives go, oh, we, we have to have government to, to define marriage and to protect marriage. No. Because if you, if you go back and you study the marriage laws, I don't know if you've actually done this, but marriage laws to begin with and marriage licenses were about control and had very racist yep. implications. I mean, they were originally designed to keep blacks and whites from marrying. Yeah. And... Uh, there's just nothing biblical about that. And then when, when you see the fact that I, I can live next door to any gay person in the world, I can be friends with a gay person, uh, and, and I, I tell people all the time, I don't have a problem in the world with gay people. They, they don't understand the difference between I don't like the lifestyle, I have biblical views on the lifestyle, but it doesn't mean I hate the person. I love the person. And I'm not going to treat the person any different. Uh, and I don't think people understand that. But knowing that just because, you know, that I think something's moral or immoral doesn't mean that if my ideas are good ideas, I shouldn't have to have the government to enforce them. So, yes, I believe that biblical morality is the best, most pure definition of, of morality because of my faith. But... Should we really have to have government to enforce that morality if it's really, truly the best way for humanity to live? If we have to have government to come in and say, no, we're going to force you to live by biblical standards? Is it? Because I make the argument, if you have to advocate for government to enforce your ideas, I think you need to really look at your ideas. Cause they're, but uh, I would look at things you know, like interventionists. You know, foreign interventionism, and I'm like that. That's not very conservative, you mm-hmm. know, because for a long time I considered myself a conservative. But when I got to looking at it, I, I realized that my view of conservatism was much more libertarian than it was conservative, because it was like, oh no, we we believe in limited government, except for roads and except for foreign interventionism and policing the world and all these different areas and the war on drugs, mm-hmm. which is immoral and does much more harm than good. <clears throat> Yeah. So, so those were the big issues. Interesting. Yeah, I think you and I we we agree on on um, well, especially coming at it from a Christian perspective. I think we yes. we hit on a lot of the same things. Um, yes. I'm also very big into voluntarism, and yes. if God's laws are the best, then shouldn't everybody be able to empirically test that that gives and brings the most prosperity? 
long life, you know, technological advancements, wealth, um, more children, all that stuff. Well, well, Scripture says taste and see that God is good. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's, that's what I love about the Bible is that you don't, the Bible is not like the Quran, where the Quran uses it itself to, you know, the Quran uses it itself to prove itself. The Bible is open to outside evidence. You know, you, you can look at the Bible and use outside evidence. The Bible does not use itself. I don't, I don't know the, the phrase that I'm looking for, but it, it doesn't have circular reasoning. Um, I would actually disagree there. Um, I think. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm not so much. Uh, I don't know if you would consider yourself an an evidentialist, but um, I think when you get to, I'm not to th- sure I'm familiar with the term. Um, let's see here. The difference would be so, like an evidentialist would say that um, he, he would use all the stuff about life and prosperity and all that stuff in order to prove God's existence. Hey, see, the people that follow God are the ones that are prosperous and do really well. Um, I don't necessarily yeah, yeah. have a problem with circular reasoning as long as um, it's not arbitrary, because everybody has okay, to. Okay. Everybody has to do it when you get to their ultimate standard. Like even okay, so, even atheists okay. would say that uh, reason is reasonable. They would use reason to to defend why reason is reasonable. Yeah, yeah, and and to me, you see, I'm, I'm not even making an argument against an atheist because I believe an atheist can be a perfectly moral person. Um, I, I believe an atheist can be a moral person. I just, sure, I do I too. Think the, the 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 problem with secularism to me is not that they can't be moral; is that they they don't have a reason why. Right. That, it's that, basically because I want to be. Right, right, and and to me that that is the uh, Ravi Zacharias. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Yes. He talks about you know the, the moral law. You know, in order for there to be a moral law, there has to be a moral lawgiver, mm-hmm. and so God, God is the reason why. But that, that, that's something that you know I'll talk about with you as a Christian. But I, I don't, you know, right. when it comes to our when it comes to our atheist friends and and political alliances, I, I don't even diverge in those things because I tend to want to focus on the things we have in common more than our differences. Right. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like I had a really fun conversation uh just a few days ago with a guy he's he's an atheist um is yeah. a- ancap society I, if he's on the instagram is how i found him but he and i had a great conversation and some really telling yeah. discussions when because he wanted to get into more of the religious aspect of things which i'm perfectly happy to do i mean my, yeah, yeah my screen name is theocrat you know for heaven's sake um yeah well that was that was kind of scary to me for a little bit to begin with i'm like wait a minute and I, I was going to ask you about that, if you don't mind me asking sure, you. Sure, go ahead. Because, because all, all of the posts and everything that I've seen from you tend to be very libertarian, you know, and I'm like, see, crap. You know, well, uh, that, that doesn't sound like a very libertarian name. Is it just one of those things that you try to use to hook people in? To... Yes and no. Um, I do believe uh, theocracy is the best, but, a, but from a voluntary standpoint. You brought okay. up the Quran. Um, the Quran is very much conversion by the sword. Um, yes. Okay. And Christianity is conversion by the sword of the spirit, which is okay. salvation and self-sacrifice. Uh, so instead of sacrificing other people to try to get them to convert, you give up yourself. But but see that that, that makes much more sense because when you think of an, a theocracy in the terms of what everybody else thinks of, right? I'm sure you you would hate that as much as I would. Yes. It's, it's yes. not. It's not. It's not about self-sacrifice which is something that our faith teaches it's it's about convert or die right and so i like i couldn't think of to be honest i couldn't think of another term uh that would be better than anarchy because a lot of people have taken the term anarchy with anarcho-capitalism and anarchy has has really bad connotations to it too but when you understand how they're using it it makes more sense so and i wanted to take theocracy and do the same thing to it. So sort of take it in a different direction in terms of definition than most people do. That, that, that's interesting. That would be a, a, a very good conversation to have. I'd, I'd like to have that sometime. Yeah, so I, we can come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but next question I'd have for you is, what are some of the most positive results that you see happening in America, positive changes? When you see people like, to talk about Glenn Beck again, when you, when you talk about his audience with the, the events at like Birmingham, when you see, when you see massive 
groups of people like that who are willing to put aside their political differences and to come together and say, well, let's just love on each other. Hmm. And, and it's it's okay that we disagree, but I don't hate you because I disagree with you. I, I don't know how to communicate that to everybody else. You you wouldn't believe yeah. the amount, amount of hate that I got yesterday. I did an article on uh, Rand Paul standing up against the president because of the uh, executive uh, national emergency order for the border wall was unconstitutional. They said, I'm going to vote against it because it's unconstitutional. The amount of hate that Rand got, the amount of hate that I got even for writing the article, and I, I didn't disclose my opinion in that article. <laughs> it was just, it was, just, and for the record, you know, I agree with Senator Paul. I think he was definitely right. Um, but I was just reporting the news, and that, that's how the majority of my articles have been. I've done a few opinion pieces, but the most of them have been just straight reporting, and it's it wasn't by by the left. It was by so-called conservatives mm-hmm. that they, they were like, you know, build the wall and he's a traitor and you know, blah blah. I'm like, what about the Constitution? It just goes to show me you you don't really care about the Constitution until you can use it against as a weapon against the other side. But when you when you see people like, uh, like I said, with Glenn's audience, and and there there are other examples of that. Riaz Patel, who would, would be a leftist, you know, but willing to have conversations and be kind and and to have open and honest conversations and and the people at the libertarian republic very uh, diverse group of people but you know we all care about each other you you have christians and people of faith and skeptics and we don't look into each other any different we're all friends we all come together for a common purpose um and we have much more in common than we do differences and and so i think that that that's some of the best things that I see going on right now is when you see, I mean, everybody wants to talk about, um, you know, the, the political movement with the left and Bernie Sanders and all those bringing people together. No, I, I think that liberty is on the verge of it because we're, we're very strong mm. nationally. We, we, we suffer on the, the local games, right. but nationally the, the liberty movement's strong. Um, I just think that it's going to take people who are willing to step out and take that that leap of faith, if you will, because I think a lot of people they they give liberty lip service, but they're like, okay, well let's let's put these ideas into action. Or like, oh no 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 no, right? Because but that's Jeff, my paycheck now that's going to be affected. Yeah, yeah, and, and so so it's like uh, Jefferson, you know, and I'm uh, summarizing Jefferson, but he said that. That liberty, having too much liberty, is much more dangerous than, uh, or, or that you would submit yourself to much more dangers. You know, having liberty, but he would rather um, put up with the dangers of having too much liberty right. than the dangers of not having enough. And I know I'm butchering the quote, but that's the synopsis of it. You know. Yeah, um, it's it, when uh, you have liberty, you have yeah. the freedom to learn from your mistakes. Yeah, at the and, very and, least. And, yeah, and and that that's what socialism attempts, and very very terribly um, fails at is the try, trying to take away the consequences. You know, right. they, they, they try to take the consequences so you don't have the freedom to fail, and if you don't have the freedom to fail, you don't have freedom at all. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. What have been some issues that you've seen people change f- that you knew beforehand that were either Republican or Democrat that have since become a Libertarian? Well, I, I'll, I'll use my, my parents as an example, even though that they, they're not Libertarians by any stretch of the imagination. But if that they have since become, especially my mother, has even admitted to becoming more conservatarian, if you will, on um, certain issues because I've explained it to her. Now, trying to get the war on drugs is kind of like pulling teeth. Mm. Uh, but, um, you know, like some of the more so- social issues like the gay marriage and, and things of that nature, it's like, no, I, I get that. And I told her, I'm like, you know, mom, mom, government doesn't belong in marriage, period. And I'm like, if somebody had explained it to me that way to begin with, North Carolina's marriage amendment did, um 
when they put that up for vote, I believe it was in 2014, if people had explained that to Christians to begin with, they would have never voted for it if they understood that God defines marriage uh, and not government. Mm -hmm. Because because if, if I'm a married man and government comes in and tears up my marriage certificate with my wife, you're still does married. Affect, <laughs> yeah. Does, does, does that affect my covenant? No. And uh, so, so when you when you start to explain the difference between, I can believe that something is is morally acceptable or not morally acceptable, and just because somebody is doing something that I believe is immoral doesn't mean that they shouldn't have the freedom to do it. Because my basis of libertarianism is rooted in free will. And so I think when you when you look at you know and I run in largely Christian circles, if you explain free will to Christians, I think that they would be and center libertarianism around free will. I think they would be much more um, receptible. I think is the right word to that. We could go back to the question about like theocracy and all that stuff if you want to. You've intrigued me. <laughs> Um, I guess the main thing, probably where most Christians would probably jump out of their, out of their socks when they heard it is I think that the, the Mosaic law is still, still applies today. Okay. So at like all of it. Okay. Um, and most people's first reaction is, well, do you eat shellfish and that type of stuff? And I say, mm. well, yeah, it's, okay. the, it's the Mosaic law as superseded by the new covenant. Okay. So we're still not supposed to be like the the purpose of why somebody couldn't eat unclean foods was they had to be clean for purposes of sacrificing in the temple, right? Okay, yeah. They couldn't defile themselves, be defiled, unclean, or for whatever reason, and then go and offer sacrifices in the temple. Okay. So in that sense, we're still not supposed to eat unclean. We're, we're still supposed to be clean when we offer a sacrifice in the temple, and we still do that today. But now okay. we we have the real deal. The uh, temple in the old covenant was merely a shadow of the reality yes. that we have now. Yes. Um, and then on top of that, um, there are two separate two separate times where the in the New Testament, one's in Acts, the yeah. sheet, the vision that Peter had of the sheet coming down. And God yeah. says, "Rise, Peter, kill and eat." And he says, "I've never eaten anything unclean." And God says, "What I call clean, don't you call unclean?" Right. And then that happened three times. Uh, but then there's another yeah. point where uh, Mark seven fourteen, and he called the people to him again and said to them, hear me all of you and understand there's nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he okay. had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him since it enters his heart? It enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Thus he declared all mm. foods clean. So, yeah, we still have a temple. Yeah. The temple is God's God's body, my body. Right. Because he sacrificed right. himself for his for His church, his people. There is even a passage in uh, Jeremiah 31, where it says that, unless you can break my covenant with the day and with the night, so that they no longer come at their appointed times then you will also have broken my covenant so that um, Levites won't be offering it sacrifices in the temple forever. Mm. So as far as I know, uh, it's nighttime and it's dark outside. So mm. that means that there are still, there are still Levites offering sacrifices in the temple and we're the new covenant Levites, new covenant yeah. priests, yeah, the priesthood yeah. of the believer. That, that, that is very interesting. That's, an interesting way to articulate that. I, I've heard similar things before. Um, I just, like I said, when I heard theocracy, it was kind of you know. right. Capital punishments. I I really yeah. think that God knew what He was talking about when He talks about community stoning. I would mm -hmm. I would love to see That's, that as the uh, default position because what if the community doesn't agree with the death penalty that comes down from a judge? Mm. You have nobody participate, and the person's not put to death. Mm -hmm. nothing nothing happens and that happened um in i think it was in fir first or second samuel there was a a point where um saul made a vow and he said nobody's going to eat until we win this battle 
and anybody who mm. does, I'm going to kill. And his son, Jonathan, didn't hear it, and he mm. ate some honey, and Saul said, okay, I'm going to kill Jonathan. And all the people said, no, you're not. Mm. We're going to keep you from doing that. It, it, it's interesting that you say that, because I, I struggle with the death penalty in general from a moral hmm. standpoint. Okay. Because of, because of my pro-life position. Um, and then also very heavy skepticism of the state. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, my, my, my objections to the death penalty as it stands are, are not without reason. I haven't, you know, just sure. not, not been able to reason through this. I just haven't been able to, um, you know, come to a conclusion to how do you deal with, you know, like people that are wrongly accused and people that have been wrongly convicted of crimes. You know, I don't think they should be put to death. The Old Testament law has a really, a really fascinating system, and it's it's absolutely brilliant. So, if somebody wrongly accuses somebody of a capital crime, and it's discovered that they testified falsely, then they're put to death instead. So it raises mm. the stakes just a little bit. Right. That would deter yeah. a lot of. That would deter basically all false witnessing. And I, and I get that. Yeah, I understand that. But when it comes to, like, um, you know, the Old Testament law says an eye for an eye, but then Christ gave us the higher law. Uh, the spirit of the law. It, it, right, right. And it's not to say that, that one makes the other invalid. The one fulfills the other. So if you're living by the law of love and the, the spirit of the law, because I believe that the letter of the law in circumstances like that will literally kill you. Yep. Uh I do like the idea of double restitution if it came to the government. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's one of the things that um, I think is very attractive, uh, yeah. basically, to everybody that I talk to. They're like, yeah, yeah that would... Yeah. Well, except other Christians, actually. There are, yeah. there are other Christians that I talk to that are like, dude, you can't... I mean, the government says we have to have prisons, so we'll, like render unto Caesar and Romans 13 and all that stuff. Oh, Lord, that's... And, oh, the, the Romans thirteen stuff absolutely kills me. When I <laughs> when when I first started getting into it, when I first started getting into politics, and I, I started to become vocal because I'm I'm very vocal about what I believe, and I pull no punches, right right or wrong. You know, if somebody can prove to me where I'm wrong, I'll, I'll I'm not arrogant. I'll, I'm honest, and I'll you know apologize for it, and I'll correct the error. But I'm very bold. I always have been. I mean, Caleb in the Bible. I think my name is very fitting. He was bold, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, he was a, it, a proselyte as well, if I recall. It, it, it took me to adulthood to realize how fitting my name was. Uh, but the Romans 13 passage, when people would start to to uh, quote that to me, I'm like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. I'm like, number one, in America, we live in a republic. We have the law of the people. We we govern ourselves as self-government, which is really what God always intended. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, you, you can look back at, at the judges, how they did much better under the judges in the Old Testament, which was self-government. But they said, no, 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 give us a king, give us a king, give us a king. And they're like, you don't want one, you don't want one. You're going to do much worse. And like, no, no, give us, give us one. Like, okay, I'll give you a king, but you're not going to like it. He's uh, going to take 10% from you in taxes. Are you ready for this? Buckle up. <laughs> right, right. And, but the whole thing about the Romans 13, I'm like, no, no, no. It's not the representatives. And I think that's where Christians in America get it wrong. Because the law in America, what's the law of the land? Our founding documents. The Constitution, and before that, the Declaration of Independence. They guarantee us self-government and ultimate liberty, the, the self-evident rights mm-hmm. that, that are granted to us by our Creator. Those are the things we submit ourselves to, if you will, the Constitution. And so the, those people who are elected to represent us work for us, not the other way around. Yep, the representative government, it, it had its hand. It's funny that representative gov- government isn't explicitly commanded, but it's something that should voluntarily come out of a people that want to be self-governed. Yeah. There was when um, Moses was having too much trouble hearing all the cases that the people would bring to him. I think it yeah. was his 
what was his father-in-law Jethro suggested yeah. why don't you have all the people decide amongst themselves who they want to hear their own cases and disputes yeah, and I believe it, it, it was an exodus. He told me, he said, pick out from the 20s, the 10s, the 100s, you know, people to represent yourselves, mm -hmm. you know, righteous men. And, right. and so it requ in order to be, and, and it's biblical uh, sentiments all throughout our heritage as Americans, um, you have to have moral men in order to have a representative republic. So regardless of where your morality comes from, and as we've acknowledged, I think Christianity is the best place to, to get it, but you have to have some kind of strong, moral, virtuous uh, society in order to have self-government. Right. If you don't have that, you can't have self-government. You have to have tyrannical government to restrain people. Yeah, I like the idea of in the church, that's what it's supposed to be. It's like, I want to yeah. pick for myself yeah. if I've got a dispute. Like, can't the people in the dispute agree on who the most righteous person is to hear their case? Yeah. I think that's uh, how it should be done in the churches. All voluntary. You pick and yeah. you can switch who you want to hear your case at, at any time. Um, and all that type of stuff. So it's oh, not yeah. like a vote yeah. that comes up once every four years. So in the four year meantime, the person can be the uh, the biggest son of hell that that you ever saw. Yeah, yeah it's like it's okay. Let's find somebody better. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. It's just pick w once you have an agreement, or even contractually speaking, like have have a, an arbitration clause or something in your yeah business transactions. Which to me that that's that's reinforcing the strength of private contracts there. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So Very I think interesting. Yeah, God God will bless us if we govern ourselves well. And absolutely, absolutely. If, if we don't govern ourselves, then God will govern us and the penalty is gonna be worse. There's another mm -hmm. really interesting part in the whole law of restitution. If somebody feels guilty for so let's say that guy that stole a hundred bucks from me, he feels guilty about it and he comes back and he says, I'm sorry, I want to give mm -hmm. you your hundred bucks back. In the right. law, if you turn yourself in, the penalty is only uh, twenty percent instead of a hundred. Mm. So if he did that, then he would he would pay me one hundred and twenty bucks instead of two hundred. So it's a huge incentive, a huge incentive for, yeah. for <laughs> people to to uh, turn themselves in to govern themselves yeah. properly. Bigly, yeah, bigly. <laughs> oh man, I'm having too much fun with this. <laughs> oh. Donald Trump is the one one uh, surefire entertainer. He definitely is. Did you see the one that I did that was published early this morning? About yes, I did. I, w I read that yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, that that was hilarious to me. Honey, I, I want to watch I, TV. Is the wind blowing? <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh my god. And, and you know, I give the man credit where credit is due. Do, do I think that he's, you know. Thomas Jefferson, absolutely not. Do I think he's a uh, George Washington? Absolutely not. Or James Madison? No way. But I, and I don't think he's God God's gift to America, like so many evangelicals were trying to say. But I definitely think that he's better than what I expected. But then at the same time, I had no expectations. Right. So the zero, bar was pretty I, low. Yeah, I had zero expectations. I expected him to be a typical New York leftist, and so. To get these things and then to have him come out and be just bold, which is what he usually does, and then sometimes that's not so good because it's like sometimes you feel like Trump, will you just shut up? You just kind of sound like my drunk uncle. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that YouTube video? Uh, it's um, drunk Trump quotes. Yeah, yeah, I have. Is it the one where, where you have like a, a redneck on his back porch and he's right, uh, right. like, yeah. You know, anybody that likes me, I like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think I actually saw that when he was running. Yeah, I did too. Uh, yeah, but but it kills me because but then this time he comes out and he he does what Trump does because Trump is an entertainer. I mean he's been that way practically his whole life, but he, and he's very bold. But this time he's actually funny because I, before you know I had never seen the thing that he did, and it wasn't just because I didn't really like him for a good portion, and I'm still you know eh, I'm not you know. Like, Trump train. I just give the man credit where credit is due. Any place like I would anybody else. You know, I'm not anti-Trump. I'm not pro-Trump. I'll just give him credit where credit's due. To see him be bold and, and and typical Trump, but then to be actually funny and not just a, a jerk, was was 
pretty refreshing, and I, th- I think that's good. America needs that. We're not laughing enough. Mm-hmm. We're we're really not. I think we hate each other too much. It's just like, oh God, you know, please, just everybody laugh. Let's have a drink or something. You know, lighten lighten everybody up. So. Right. Yeah, and unfortunately, Trump pretty much only does that at the expense of leftists, especially in that article today. <laughs> Though, oh, yeah. At least it's a rather small... Well, I, I can't even say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I know. I wish... I wish that the Trump supporters didn't confirm... And when I say Trump supporters, I'm not talking about the, the people who voted for him because... They felt like that was their only option. I'm talking about the diehard, you know. Mm-hmm. I was Trump since day one. The people that, to be honest, you can't really reason with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- those kind of people. I wish that they could see the ugliness and the unconstitutionality of the Republican Party just the same as the Democrats. And it's like, okay, well... What what if what if the Democrats turn around and did a Bernie Sanders? Would you would you be okay with it just because it come from a Republican? A lot of them are, especially yeah, when it comes I, to gun I, issues. Yeah, well, that that killed me because it was one of the the more recent things that Trump did that infuriated me. Trying to ban the bump stocks, the the bump stock thing. Yeah, it infuriated me, and I called that out. You say you care about the Constitution. This is, you know, even if the Constitution didn't exist, we have a right to protect ourselves. This is an infringement on that. It says, shall not be infringed. That means if I can afford a tank, I will say it. If I can afford a tank, I should be able to buy a tank and have the tank sit in my backyard. Yes, leftist, I said it. (laughs) uh, and, And I would do it, too. I'm that kind of guy. Conservatives... If they're an honest conservative, are much more libertarian than they are conservative. That, that's how I come to the, the realization of I'm a libertarian and not a conservative is because I still have, like I said, conservative social views, for lack of a better word, things that I wouldn't personally do. But I, I wouldn't want to keep use the government to keep anybody else from doing it. I'll just advocate for it privately. Yeah, one of the things that I've been reasoning through, really, um, and it and it goes back to like death penalties and stuff like that um i think i I, i'm sort of between a rock and a hard place there are a lot of people that say oh well the government should be enforcing um the death penalty on murderers and things like that and i'm like yeah i think the 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 correct penalty for murder would be death but then also i don't i can't really see any other way that i would be be able to enforce that other than through like community stoning basically like everybody's on board with this and it's done mm. in public to make people afraid and you do it once and i guarantee you murders will probably go down especially mm. if everybody who's had a hand in it now they have a memory to go along with that to keep them from doing the same thing now now my question to you because you're you're a sensible individual what what scares the hell out of me would be how, how would you prevent that from turning into a place like an Islamic how an Islamic country is with, with their stonings their stonings um, as far as I know they usually only have to have one witness especially for things like if a woman was unfaithful mm-hmm. and that type of stuff it's literally you could have something happen like the Brett Kavanaugh hearing yeah and it's like, well, death penalty. Obviously, it goes different for guys. Like, you got to have a lot of witnesses for guys, and none of the witnesses can be women. Uh, yeah. But the Bible, it doesn't differentiate. It's just you need multiple witnesses, and they can be men or women. Okay, because I, I've never really had anybody, which I've never heard, heard any pers- Christian advocate for public stonings either until today. So we've had some yep. had some uh, interesting conversations, and it's definitely things for me to consider. I, I don't want a central capital punishment. Obviously, well, yeah, stoning that, would be a, an incredibly decentralized. It would take it out of the hands of the state and put it directly into the hands of the people. And, and that that's that's one of the biggest problems that I have with the death penalty is that you know this kind of what we were talking about before with the centralization of it. You know, what do you do? You know, if, if a jury of five or six men convict a man and, and he really was truly innocent but he's already dead you know what can you do you can't give him his life back right 
Yeah, if you find out that somebody was testifying falsely after the person's already dead, then all the people that witnessed against him are supposed to be put to death, biblically speaking. Yeah. In terms okay. of in terms of the Mosaic law, that's what you would do. So so it gives it gives the incentive of, you know, if you don't get this right, we're gonna kill you. Mm-hmm. You okay. that would basically eliminate all frivolous lawsuits. And it wouldn't be just murder, it would be anything that somebody's falsely accused of. Whatever the false witnesses intended to do to the person they're accusing should be done to them instead. You know, I, and I don't, I have never heard, and I grew up in the church, I have never heard a preacher or any Christian person advocate for that or even try to explain that or even consider it publicly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes and, you wonder. I, I would love, because I consider myself somewhere in between the minarchist and the classical liberal. I use those two terms interchangeably. Um, but I, I would love to get to the point where the government is so small that ANCAPs and minarchists could argue about ha- that what the minarchists want is too much government. <laughs> yeah. if, we can, if, we, if we can get to that point, I would gladly support that. And I, and I tell people, as a minarchist, if I could get if I could get behind an ANCAP, if I knew I could get an ANCAP elected just to shake up things a bit, sure I would do it. Because <laughs> I think it would help balance it out. I mean, we've got oh yeah, for sure, con- friggin' communist. <laughs> you know, and they're not even afraid to say it. They're part of the communist party, and they're running for office. <laughs> yeah, they don't have to hide I, it anymore. Because to me, socialism. I mean, you study your history. Socialism and communism are are no different, really. Socialism is only the intermediate step, right? You know, right? Because you you, you have two options there: either go to more government control, which that they always fail. It always fails. But you you either go to total government control, which is the, that always collapses before it gets there, or you privatize. So, so inevitably, in order to succeed, you have to have that private division of labor. All of our political problems, I think, really do go back to the Bible. Yeah. And the reason that we're in the mess that we're in is because we don't govern ourselves properly. And the reason we don't do that is because we've sort of rejected what the Bible has to say about abortion and marriage and, um, you know, penalties for theft. And there, it's, so it's like you have... I think it's in Deuteronomy 5 that God said, you sh- you can't add to the words that I'm giving to you and you can't take away. Mm-hmm. So we've taken away, we've added all these laws saying that you can't even smoke marijuana or else we're going to lock you in prison. Oh, yeah. And prison isn't even scriptural whatsoever. Right. So we raise the, the penalty for don't get drunk and say, we're going to jail you and make you spend years of your life for doing this when God says don't do it but we're not it's not a criminal offense and and then you you can't even put drunkenness drunkenness and being high from marijuana or any other drug on the same level because they all affect you differently I think that's one of the biggest problems that conservatives have when it comes to teaching their children about drugs is because they don't teach them correctly and they just said drugs are bad don't do them yeah. here's an aspirin yeah, right. <laughs> Here's an aspirin. Why are you... The, yeah, the whole thing always goes back to... It's a heart issue. Yeah. Drunkenness, it's not don't ever touch alcohol. It's don't get addicted to it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't have a problem in the world with somebody taking a drink once in a while. Even if they wanted to drink a beer every day, I'm not going to look at them, you know, you know, that's them. It's drunkenness. Right. Jesus drank wine, and don't get me started. I mean, we talked, we, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, where I started. I started out in a very legalistic Baptist church that literally told me, uh, uh, no, the, the wine was like grape juice. No, it was not. It was the best wine. I, I'm like, okay, number one, okay, you just referred to the best wine. What, what about what happened? You're referencing Jesus at the wedding, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You say the best for last after he made. And what about the the episodes in the Old Testament where where Noah got drunk? I'm There's like, even okay. a psalm that says that God gave men, uh, wine is a good gift from God to make men's hearts merry. That's in the Psalms. Yeah, and, and Benjamin Franklin quoted that. So <laughs> that's a uh, that's a biblical reference there. But but obviously, 
it, it's not about what is good or bad. And I don't. I I tell people all the time. I don't think that anything in and of itself, as far as anything on this planet, is bad. It's what man chooses to do with it, mm-hmm. and it's abuses of it. Yep. I, I like it. I like a uh, phrase that was from Jim Caviezel. He said um, he was talking about his, his role in Passion of the Christ, but he was talking about America and freedom. He said something about something to the effect of freedom and is having the uh, the 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 will to do what you ought, you know. Yep. Have, having the ultimate will to do what you ought to do, you know. Yeah. If you're not free to do what you ought to do, then but somebody forces you to do it, is that moral? Mm-hmm. I would yeah. I would say no. Yeah, because that goes against free will. Yeah, I was talking to my dad about this today. There's four levels of tyranny. Uh, or four types, and maybe not necessarily levels. They're not perfectly linear. Yeah. The worst kind of government is a government commanding you to do something immoral. Mm. Go kill this yep. person. Go steal this. Do all you know yep. things that are absolutely off limits. Right. And the next, the uh, a lesser form of tyranny would be government simply allowing evil to be done, like abortion. Right. Right. Then there's preventing good from being done so like feeding the homeless yeah which we've seen cases of time and time again right yeah. and then the last one is the government mandating something good with penalty that that scripture doesn't it doesn't command so there's a there's a passage in scripture that says we're commanded if there's somebody on the side of the road that's struggling with his ox you're obligated to go help him but then it doesn't give any penalty for not doing that it's a sin. I mean, just just like drunkenness. It's a sin. Yeah. But if you if you fail to do that, we're not going to uh, arrest you. And but that, that that goes back to it's a moral obligation. Right. Right. Well, even even uh, tithing. We're commanded to tithe in the Old Testament, but there was no penalty given for not tithing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if you want to say that that's God's version of taxes, God enforces it. Right. It's not the government's job to do that. Well, and that, that that's the whole thing. And I hear, you know, and Cav talk about, you know, which you and I can agree on the volunteer, volunteerism part. I'm sure if we kept talking, there'd be areas where we could have some interesting conversations of what you think about that. But ultimately, things should be voluntary. And if I can make things, if I can As make far as the civil more, government goes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If I can make things as voluntary as possible, that that that's the goal. Yep. And because, if you don't, then if, God 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 judges the nations. Yeah, because because if if it's absolutely necessary for society for the preservation of government uh, or for the preservation of society, rather, excuse me, why wouldn't you want to pay for it? Right. You know why? Why? Why do you need? Why do you need um, somebody to force you to pay? You know, pay soldiers, for example. Because I don't think there's a, a person in, on the, uh, regardless of the place they stand politically, that would uh, disagree that we need an army to protect us from invaders. You know, the, the role of the army, you know, uh, could be highly debated. You know. But I don't think there's a person in America today that would say that we don't need an army, period. Right. It's, yeah, yeah it's, the question is, how do you fund it? Right, right. There's a really yeah, interesting yeah. passage, and I can send you a link to this later. It'd be kind of long to get into detail here, but in Deuteronomy 20, there's a passage that talks about how armies are supposed to be funded. And they get paid for. So let's say, let's say China did a, an, a land invasion and invaded, uh, California. Yeah. If California wants to retaliate, they don't get to tax money. They don't get to use tax money in order to retaliate. It's you raise an army and the army has to be strictly volunteer men 20 years and older. And you go and you defeat the cities that was making that, that was making war against you. And when you beat them, Everything in their city 
is yours, and then also the people become your indentured servants and yeah. and work off the damages that they did. That's how we're yeah. supposed to be funded. Yeah, you know, that that's that's interesting because the, the first part where you're talking about you you raise an army when you when you have to fight a war you raise an army that that sounds exactly like what the founding fathers had mm -hmm. because they, they, they didn't believe in standing army washington people had like, to ride around the countryside convincing right. people that it was a just cause right it, it was uh people like hamilton that what they wanted the, the standing armies it wasn't you know the jeffersonians or the you know uh, it was just pretty much, you know, everybody come together and, uh, the, you know, we'll, we'll have, you know, trained troops and then we'll have our militias too and they'll, they'll all come together when it's time to fight. But then when, when it's not time to fight, then we go home. Right. And right. Uh, then I think about um, what, what you said, though, of two about the indentured servants. I think that's interesting, but that could lead to another topic is the, the whole thing where people try to make the argument that the Bible was for slavery. No, it wasn't. Because yeah. you, if you if you look into what slavery was at that time, legal slavery, yeah, it was never yeah. kidnapping somebody and then you just go sell them. That was actually a capital crime. Yeah, in the Old Testament, it was more it was more like indentured servitude. Mm -hmm. And there were also strict limits placed on what the what the quote unquote owner could how he could treat his slaves. Yeah, like so if it, if you beat a slave and you knock out his tooth, you cause any kind of permanent injury, then the slave is free. It doesn't matter yeah. if he owed you two billion dollars; that slave is free. Right. It, it wasn't. It wasn't like the slavery that the founding fathers fought against. And I, I'm so tired of the leftists trying to distort the narratives that the founders were for slavery. No, that the, there were many of them who advocated for it to the time that they died, but they didn't. <laughs> I mean, Jefferson advocated against it, hmm. and pe people don't want to look into that. Have you read um, anything by Barton, David Barton? I've seen him. I've never been introduced to him, but he was actually at a, a Republican convention that I went to once. I met him once. Wonderful guy. Um, I met his son. Wonderful guy. And uh, his son did a video on, on libertarianism versus conservatism very recently that was very very bad <laughs> and uh, yeah i don't think it did a, uh, a good service to either one side of the argument because it was just uh, okay this is libertarian and he didn't really explain really what a libertarian was and he's like i'm pretty much a conservative and this is why we should be conservative because conservatives want to conserve something in society uh for the next generation and i'm like timothy yeah, I'm like, you know, you, you may not remember me. I know you're my friend on Facebook, but we, we sat and we ate together. I'm I'm a libertarian. Just because I don't think that government should in, uh, should uh, play a role in enforcing, uh, you know, certain laws doesn't mean I don't care about society. Mm -hmm. I mean, did, did you hear the, um, the conversation that uh, Austin Peterson had with uh, Ben Shapiro? No, I haven't heard that. That is a very, very good conversation, and he talks about how uh, Austin talks about how conservatives need to accept more the libertarian view of government, and libertarians would do well to accept conservatives' view of social institutions, so like churches, families, synagogues, mm -hmm. so on. Yeah, and see, to me, that that was very easy because I, I'm coming at libertarianism from a socially conservative background, so I already had that understanding. You know, uh, if government's not going to do it, somebody's going to pick up the slack, and it's, it was our job to begin with. Right. Just like with the welfare state. If the church was being the church, the welfare state would not exist. Mm -hmm. Or it wouldn't. It may still exist, but there would be no competition. The church would well, do it so much better. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. That there would be there would be no need for it. Right. Which, yeah. Before the uh, uh, welfare state came up and food stamp programs and all that stuff, people. I mean, the churches. I mean, for heaven's sake, the Catholic, all the Catholic hospitals. You know, Saint Mary's, Saint yeah. Joseph. Um, that was all well, people that that believe in charity, doing all well, that stuff. Ron, Ron Paul. I don't know if you know that, but I've, I've listened to interviews from Ron Paul. You know, and he talked about in his early days in medicine. He started out working for private uh, Catholic hospitals. He did a lot of work with those. 
And he's like, so, so don't tell me that it doesn't work because I, I, I did it. And it's like, because of these government laws that made it impossible for, for us to do what we were doing. Right. So it, it pretty much run them out of business. But, but we're the ones that have the commandment, not the government. Yeah. And there's a, it's a, it's a, there's a meme. It's like, um, Jesus is giving the sermon on the Mount and he says, clothe, you know, clothe the poor and feed the hungry. And people Didn't said, wait a minute, Romans? we're supposed to let the Romans do that for us. Uh, I love the libertarian Jesus. Man. Yeah. 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 I've, I've seen so many of them, but, but it's, it's so true because it's, we, we were commanded to do that, not government. And it goes back to personal responsibility. Mm-hmm. If, if you I mean, and, and Republicans want to talk about that so much. Personal responsibility. Okay, raise what your own what? children and don't expect other people to pay for their education. Well, well, well you can't. But that's the schools, you know, the American way. Uh, no, it's not. We didn't have a... The overwhelming majority of people, when you go back and look in, in our history, the overwhelming the majority of the founders were either private school and, and mostly by a tutor mm-hmm. or went to some kind of private school or they were homeschooled, which really, you know, bringing in a tutor is really just like homeschooling. It's just paying somebody else to do it. Under the New England house. Primer, like everybody was raised on the New England Primer and all those other little books that James Barton, yeah. or, uh, David Barton loves to talk about. Yeah, I, I actually have a copy of that. Yeah, we do too. Yeah. Uh, and and all, all those are biblical based. Mm-hmm. Yeah, A f- uh, and Adam's fall, we send all. Yeah, and it goes through the entire alphabet. Right. Yeah, I thought it was, it's fascinating. And I have, um, it was one, um, George Washington's Rules for Decency and Common Behavior yep. that he wrote, you know, based off of the French thing about how a gentleman should behave in, in private. Right. Yeah, uh, that tells you how much of a homeschool family we were. We actually read that as a family when I was growing oh, up. Oh, wow. Because, see, I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't have that until I met Timothy because he, he came to the church I was attending at the time. Um, and uh, the, the local chapter of the Tea Party I was with, um, we actually financed it to get him to come, and we opened it up to the community. But he was selling it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe there's this. I've got to pick it up. And uh, I'm like, because I want anything to do with the founding fathers, you know, and uh, especially primary... Like, I will tell you, God blesses me to be a millionaire. That will be one thing that I will invest in is primary source documents. Mm-hmm. Going, to, going to the auctions, buying things from the Civil War and from the Revolution and things like that. Things that I love what Mercury One has done to be able to open up and have a... Um, a, a uh, ongoing museum you know that they open up at times of the year yeah have david you, barton that's that's, been, that's uh, his whole thing uh yeah buying old really incredibly valuable things like we actually got to he has it you go if you ever take a tour of his um his offices he literally yeah. has one of the uh bibles that the constitution the um that congress published yeah it's one of the rarest books in the world and it's literally just sitting out on a desk and you can thumb through it I think that I would probably borderline get to shakes just to be, <laughs> be, to be to be near something with so much history. Well, yeah, it's a mixed yeah. mixed emotions for me because it was they used taxes to fund the publishing of it. Yeah, but still, the, all the arguments saying that you know separation of church and state and the founding fathers weren't believers and stuff. Okay, well then explain this. I don't even agree with it, but explain this to me. Yeah, right. Well, well the whole thing. To, to me, okay, p- people don't understand that. Separation of church and state was to protect government from getting involved in the state, not from religious people getting involved in government to express their religious conscience. If and it, people have such very wildly varying definitions of what the word state even means. Like, the Bible doesn't yeah. talk in terms of states. It talks yeah. in terms of nations, and it talks in terms of cities. But but when you when you read you know and that's the one that kills me and and um, the Jefferson lies if you go read that because I I was I always struggled because I've always been a big big fan of Jefferson and then I heard these things about Jefferson that weren't really you know, didn't paint him as as such a good guy in some of his private life things and, and 
not somebody that would be too friendly to Christianity in some cases. But keep in mind, I grew up in going to the public school. But, and I didn't learn a lot of this stuff till I got to college, and then I got introduced to Barton. And then I read uh, The Jefferson Lies, which is not Barton's opinion. It's all primary source stuff from Jefferson's letters and people that knew Jefferson. And then I read things like the Jefferson Bible. I have a copy of the Jefferson Bible, which kills me because it's not even called the Jefferson Bible. It's the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And it's not even cutting out the, the divine parts. If you look into it, it's just centering on the red letters of Jesus. And he did two. Most people that make arguments, you know, they talk about the Jefferson Bible, they don't know that he did two. One he didn't get to finish. The second one, the the first one he did was um, for uh, evangelizing the Indians. Barton talks about this, and he pulls up the primary documents. Because Jefferson actually signed letters for Congress to go in to pay missionaries to evangelize the tribe of Indians. Wow, and I, I I don't think I don't think that it it might not have been when I, he he may have been governor at the time, you know, I, so it may not have been a federal thing, but he went in to go pay or sign letters to have people for missionaries to come in and and evangelize Indians, and he got up with one of his missionary friends and he said, you know what, uh, the Indians are getting put off by Christianity because they're getting off you know, hung up on the Old Testament stuff. Hmm. So if we can if we can just start them out with the words of Jesus, because the words of Jesus are so simple to understand, and the moral teachings of Jesus, th- then maybe they'll accept it better. And so that was his original plan with the first one. Hmm. The second one was just, you know, the moral teaching for his own use. It, it wasn't, and then Congress actually republished that in the 1950s, and distributed it to members of Congress because they said, if you live by the moral teachings of Jesus, you're not going to legislate immorally. Wow. Imagine, so, well, <laughs> imagine that today. Yeah. And so when I read that or when I heard those things, and then when I saw things about how he fought to, to abolish the slave trade or to make the slave trade much harder his entire life, and the fact that he wanted to free his own slaves that he inherited. He wanted to free his own slaves, but he couldn't because Virginia law prohibited him at the time. Wow. And that the man, the man virtually went bankrupt caring for his slaves at the end of his life. But he, he couldn't free them because Virginia law didn't, didn't, uh, didn't allow him to do it. Because Barton goes in and he talks about how um, that there were people that um, that Jefferson associated with and other people in Virginia because of the way the laws were, if they could afford to, and they had slaves if they wanted to free them, they moved hmm. because they, they were so dead set on freeing the slaves. But you know he, he couldn't do that, and uh, but but that that's one of the reasons he went bankrupt uh, towards the end of his life and was virtually you know poverty stricken just about. Hmm. I didn't know that. That that rocked my world, and, and you do know that the Library of Congress, the original Library of Congress, was Jefferson's private library. I didn't know that. It, it is since obviously it's, it's since been expanded. Right. But but the original Library of Congress was Jefferson's private library, and he sold that off to pay his debts that he acquired as a result of caring for slaves. Hmm. That's amazing. Makes you, makes you paint Jefferson a little bit different than what they teach you in public school. Oh, yeah. The government that we have, we're supposed to be good stewards of that. Yeah. People were thinking about government a whole lot more biblically uh, back then. Like the whole, uh, what was it, the the... Robe Brigade or something like that. It was the ministers that were all... Oh, the Bl- Black Robe Regiment. Bla- Black Robe Regiment, yeah. All those yeah, guys yeah. that would give political sermons because ultimately, I like to say um, religion and politics are the same thing. Yeah. Uh, 
people just label something as politics when they want Christians to stop talking about it. That that's interesting that you say that. Then that's that's very interesting. I w- I wish that somebody would say something like that to the other Christians just to see how they would respond. Well, abortion that's a Bible issue. But all of a sudden you t- you say that it's political and all of a sudden mm-hmm. now the church is supposed to shut up and be quiet. Well, to, and to me, every single one of the quote-unquote political issues are at the root moral issues. Mm-hmm. Taxes. And that's, that's what the Bible addresses. And, and like, the, the whole idea that, that politics is such a dirty word in the church disgusts me, because that's another thing that Barton points out. Politics, what, what is politics? It's policy. Do you not think that God cares about, and the people of God should care about the policy of the nation that they live in? Taxes, the Bible has an awful lot to say about taxes and how right. when they become forcefully applied by a nation, then that's that's due to God's people rejecting God's law and God saying, okay, this is the judgment. You're not going to tithe, so I'm going to bring in somebody that's going to extract it from you and take your right. children. It's the same thing with, with uh, abortion. Like, okay, Murder, that's an extremely moral issue. Um, homosexuality, the drug war, uh, international wars, those are all very moral, moral things issues. that the Bible talks mm. about. I mean, for heaven's sake, the, the North and Southern Kingdom, they split over a tax disagreement. Because somebody was right and somebody was wrong. Or somebody was more right and somebody was more wrong. <laughs> it still wasn't a great, a great uh, disagreement, mm. but... More right, and more wrong. That, that that kills me. I think that uh, not not many of our our discussions today have changed that much. If we if we would realize the flaws in our own selves and our own arguments mm. before before we try to to oppose that on our neighbors. To me, that that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, "Take the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of your neighbors." Right. Right. It's judge, judge yourself, govern yourself, self-government. And yep. So when I talk about, uh, uh, I'm a big believer in theocracy, there's a really interesting article by an author named Gary North. He has an article entitled Bottom Up Theocracy. Mm. And ultimately, theocracy, God's kingship starts with the individual. And yeah. it has to work itself out and upwards. It's not a top-down authoritarian structure. It's the highest authority <clears throat> in the universe God himself yeah. sacrifices himself in order yeah. to redeem the lowest and then the lowest will want to worship and it works its way back up through social institutions, financial institutions, you know, the church, the family, all that stuff. And, and then when, when you look at the fact that we have the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness of life in ourselves. We're now considered we are, brothers of Christ. Yeah, we, we, are, we are the literal hands and feet of Christ. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so people they they kill me when they say, "Well, you know, we'll we'll pray about this and we'll pray about that." And I'm like, "Well, pray, pray, pray all you want." You know, I'm like, w- "What happened if Jesus just said, you know, uh, uh, okay, th- there's a sick woman. I I pray for you." And no, he didn't do that. He just healed them. Mm-hmm. He loved everybody he ever met. He healed everybody, every person that was ever sick. Healed them. He loved everybody he ever met. He he didn't you know just sit around and oh I'm going to pray for you. I think that's a cop out a lot of times. I really do. Yeah. And, and I think that that when it comes to um, issues of um, yeah the the way I look at prayer is this, and you may I don't think you'll disagree. Prayer is just like a conversation between God and me, the, the same way as I'm talking to you. Prayer is the way that I know what God wants me to do on a day-to-day basis, how I align myself and make sure that I'm in line with what God wants me to do so I can put my mind right, to renew my mind, to carry out the, and to be empowered to carry out the will of God in the earth. That, that's the way I look at prayer. Yep. When Jesus was, you know, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's he was praying about things that he was going about to do. Yeah. God, this is really hard. I don't want to do this, but if this is your will, this is about you. This isn't about me. This is what you want. So I'll do it. You know? Right. 
and, and and I mean, I think about you know, if I, if I can disclose a little bit of personal information before before I got ready to talk to you, I prayed. I said, God, you know, speak through me, you know, have me say what what you want me to say. Let let me speak and say what you have me to say, not what I want to say. Uh, let me say only what you would say and do only what you would do. And that's what I try to do every day. Now, sometimes I fail at that, but that, that's the goal for every day when I wake up. Right. And But what's the part? You can't just pray that and hope that God just magically puts things into your head. That that prayer is a prayer of action on your part as well. Absolutely. Where do I get the will of God from? How do I know what it is? I have to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, read and listen. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it's, it's an active participatory thing because the, the way... If you don't have the Spirit, if you do not have the Spirit, there is no difference between the Bible and any other book. The Spirit is what makes the Bible come alive. Right. Yeah. I mean, the the devil knew the Bible pretty well. Yeah. Unbelievers read the Bible all the time. Yeah. Why unbelievers stumble over certain things is because they they haven't been awakened to the the Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, that they... They see the law, and they get called up by the letter of the law. That's all they have. There's a really interesting. Like, there's a really interesting um, analogy that that I never realized before a, a few months ago. You remember God gave Moses the Ten Commandments twice. Yeah. So, I view that as a symbolism between the first covenant and the the, the old covenant and the new covenant. Okay. In the old covenant, God brings Moses up the mountain and then God writes the 10 commandments out for Moses. Okay. And then he gives them to Moses and he says, do these Moses walks down the mountain. He sees everybody's sin and he breaks the 10 commandments. Right. So he goes back up the mountain and God says, okay, I'll give them to you again, but I'm going to speak them and you're going to write them yourself. Right. That you're like, I'm going to, I'm going to speak these to you. I'm going to give you my word. I'm not going to write them down on tablets of stone. I'm going to speak, I'm going to give you my word, and then that that um, that law is going to come from you, and you're going to write it down so that it comes mm-hmm. from your heart. Well, it's, it's the law of God that's written in our hearts. Mm-hmm. And then and, Moses takes those Ten Commandments down, and they go in the tabernacle. What's the temple a picture of? The temple's a picture of us. God's people. Yeah. And it, so it goes God, into the yeah. heart of the temple, the heart of God's you're people. Right. You're right. It's the shadow for us. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I think that's very interesting, and I I, I don't know if you you agree here, but that that's why I make the argument too, because of just us being made in the image of God. Period. That that's why I believe that every man has some level of morality, whether they acknowledge it or not. Everybody has that, a conscience. Yeah. Yeah. That that's why agnostics, and I'll say agnostics because I don't believe that there's any true such thing as an atheist. Me neither. The only. In, the uh, the only intellectually honest position is to to be an agnostic, because to to truly say that you're an atheist is a very arrogant position. I don't even believe that agnostics exist. Everybody knows that God exists. They just deny it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah the, and that that's a conversation to be had. But I, I'll 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 give the agnostic that, you know, when because I, I, I'm not going to, you know, just make that assertion of. Right off the bat, they're not because too to, kind to that assertion. No, yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to because if if you look at that, it, it's not my job to convert anybody. You know, I just live out live out the way God wants me to live, and He takes care of that. If they see God through me, which I have faith that they ultimately will, then great. You know, and and that's what I try to do. But but I, I would agree with you there. I I, I think that, that people, they just, a lot of people have been through a lot of hard things in life. And I think some people have been through such terrible things that I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish them on anybody. And that they don't ha- have a way to explain it and they struggle with it. And there's things that I would struggle explaining or, or trying to, uh, deal with even with my faith and I think they blame those things on God and sometimes unintentionally 
You know, I, I don't look at the, at the, the person as, as necessarily a bad person. My heart goes out to the person, but it's not God's fault. Yeah, it's our fault. Yeah. Right, right. And, and I tell people, we live in a broken world because of original sin. But Christ freed us from that. And now the ball's in our court to restore that. You know. Yeah, the gospel is not a suggestion, it's a command. God says, you must believe yeah. what I've told you to believe. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm trying to remember who I heard say it, and I, and I don't think this is right, but I think a lot of people often do it, that they get their image of God by taking the best possible human um, being they could think of, the, the best possible version of themselves, and multiplying that by, let's say, a thousand or 10,000, mm-hmm. you know, but, but God's goodness is so much better than we could ever imagine. So, so even the best version of me and me on my best day, I'm terrible compared to God. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could talk about my own sins and they're, they're, you know, I could probably fill up a room with them. Yeah. But, you know, taking the best version of me and then multiplying that by a million, I'm, I'm terrible compared to God. The letter of the law without spirit, when you live by the letter of the law and not by the spirit of the law, it will literally kill you. Yep. The only difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, it's not that one, you have the law with one and you don't have the law with the new covenant. It's where Mm -hmm. is that, where does that law reside? Mm -hmm. If it resides outside your body, then you're going to die. If it resides inside you, then you'll live. Yeah. And And I heard somebody else say, and I thought it was very good. I actually heard it this week. They said, not everything in the Old Covenant is Old Covenant. You know, the, the, There's New Covenant in the Old Testament, and not everything in the New Testament is New Covenant. There's Old Covenant stuff in the New Testament. You, know, you really we, can't we are, understand the New Covenant without a firm understanding right. of the Old. Right. And and so the, 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 the New Covenant is the fulfillment of the Old you know, but when when we look at when we look at Old Testament passages, we have to look at it through the lens of okay, is this has this been fulfilled? How does this still apply in a new in a new covenant context? Right, because there are a lot of shadows in the old covenant that we can't go back yeah. to. We can't go back to animal sacrifices because something better yeah. has come. Yeah, yeah, or or you know, literal temple buildings and arts of covenant. Why would I want to go back to an Ark of the Covenant with a li- with a God who who lives in God, me, <laughs> uh, who, who literally lives in me, who I can communicate with twenty four seven? Why would I want to go back to putting him into a, into a box? Literally speaking, somebody? yeah, yeah. Literally, why would I do that? There's there's so much freedom now, and, and t- there always has been that freedom. But it was man on the, man who chose to not walk into that because you you can see examples of that freedom walked out in the new te- I mean the old testament examples with David's life and I think God God longed from the very beginning to have what He has with us now but I don't think a lot of people Christians included have woken up to the reality of that what what they can truly have and I don't know all the you know the the implications of that, but I, I do know that the fullness of the Godhead lives inside every believer. Priesthood of the believer. The, it's very important. In Revelation, we're we're said to be a royal priesthood. So yeah. not only are we priests, we're also kings. Yeah. Self government. It is. It really is. I have really enjoyed this conversation. I have as well. It's good to talk to you, Caleb. I'm an I'm a night owl anyway. I, my sleep schedule is all out of whack, but. But, okay. Uh, it makes me good at this job, though, because some of that breaking news comes late at night. So. Oh, that's right. That's right. I, I grab it before anybody else can, and that's really made me look good in Austin's eyes. So <laughs> awesome. It kind of makes me puff out my chest a little bit. <laughs> well, you better you, you got to keep doing that, especially when you're pumping that iron. <laughs> oh, oh, oh! You you've seen some of that. Yeah, I'm I'm working on it. I'm a long way from where I want to be, but uh, definitely making some progress. I can start to see it. Yeah, that's awesome. Keep it up. Yeah.